So what's going on everybody? I'm back with another video. And today I will be picking up from where I left off from yesterday. So if you did not see the previous video, I don't know why you're still subscribed at this point, but I would recommend that you give it a watch. And so, okay, as I was saying from yesterday, the Maitreya is an interdimensional being who went around the planet leaving his handprint, a giant handprint at that, in the mirrors of various people until someone snapped a photo of it and made copies of it. Ever since then, a secret organization that will have to remain nameless has been channeling this being as he is believed to be an avatar for the Christ or Messiah. One of the channelers who goes by the name of Red Viking underscore 45, who you will not find online, wrote a letter to the author of this particular book about his experience with channeling this entity and the prophecy he was given. And here is my attempt at decoding it. So let's start with the prophecy itself. It reads, the gates shall be opened from the center of the planet. They shall emerge. And I will take my rightful place at the helm of this great vehicle. The seven tricksters will dance across the heavens in celebration of my return. I will reclaim the remnants of my kingdom. The sons and daughters of Enki will be lifted up by the knowledge of their true nature as encoded in the essence of life. Let's begin with the first line. The gates shall be open. I think that's pretty straightforward. It means that whatever was previously held back or hidden will now come to the forefront, okay? It is a point of freedom. The next line, from the center of the planet, they shall emerge, okay? The center may refer to the literal center of the planet being the Earth's core, Or it could refer to the center of land mass on the Earth's surface, which is the pyramids, the great pyramids of Giza. Okay. Now, Billy Carson spoke about a deity by the name of Thoth or Toth burying or storing a spaceship that he was riding in when he got here under the pyramids of Giza. I'm quoting Billy Carson. And so with that in mind, perhaps the ship is sentient separated into parts 
that will come together as one. Hence, they shall emerge. Perhaps he's talking about pieces of a ship that were separated that will emerge and come together as one. Or perhaps that line is referring to a race of extraterrestrials living inside of the actual earth. Okay. Next line. And I will take my rightful place at the helm of this great vehicle. So this is the Maitreya steering or taking control of a UFO that has been emerged and rightful because he is perhaps the curator of it himself. All right. Next line. The seven tricksters will dance across the heavens in celebration of my return. Okay. The number seven is used commonly in esoterica when it comes to divine sovereignty. Okay. You have seven Archangels in Christianity, Hebrew traditions. You have seven archons in Gnosticism. You have seven main chakras. You have seven universal principles in Hermeticism. You have seven C's and the list goes on and on. But he says seven tricksters. And to me, this is the only line of the prophecy that has a bit of a negative connotation to it because trickery implies that you're trying to fool somebody, right? And then I thought about it and said, hmm, let me do some research on the meaning of a trickster throughout history so I can make some light of this. And as it turns out, nearly every mythology has a trickster god. And then I realized after doing some studying and reflecting on it, that their style of trickery is not done for their own selfish gain. Amusement, money, or for scamming. It's not done for that. Their trickery is associated with playing games with people when it comes playing mind games with people when things get too stagnant. They arise to lead you to a different perspective and remind you of possibilities. So if I was to give a example of a righteous trickster, I would have to say to go watch the original Lion King movie. And skip to the scene where Simba, as an adult, first meets Rafiki, the baboon. And think about what he did for him in that interaction. Think about what it led to. Enlightenment for Simba. Tricksters are also very intelligent, more than they act at times. All right, let's continue on with the next phrase. Okay. The seven tricksters will dance across the heavens. Okay, so 
in order to dance with somebody, right, in order to dance, to properly dance, you have to be in a certain alignment with them. You have to mirror their motion in a way. So the seven tricksters dancing across the heavens could refer to the alignment of the seven planets, excluding Pluto, because Pluto is no longer considered a planet in mainstream astronomy, and excluding Earth, because we're actually on Earth now. And so in astrology, when the planets align, it's always associated with a great awakening and a new beginning. Dancing across the heavens in celebration of, of my return. That could be literal or it could be metaphorical. Next line. I will reclaim the remnants of my kingdom. I think that one is, um, I think that's pretty straightforward. This kingdom could be Egypt. If, as I stated earlier, this great vehicle that he spoke about, if it were to arise, then most likely it would be arising from Egypt. Or he, or he could be referring to the whole planet as his kingdom. Next line, the sons and daughters of Enki will be lifted up by the knowledge of their true nature as encoded in the essence of life. Now, if you don't know who Enki is, whose name means the Lord of Earth to the ancient Sumerians, his name, his actual name means Lord of Earth. The Sumerians were the very first recorded recorded civilization. And they know him as the Lord of Earth. They know him as the world's greatest scientist. And they know him as the father of humankind. He was or is a benevolent God interested in raising up and teaching humanity, not oppressing them. To the Greeks, he would be Prometheus, the God who stole fire from the higher gods and gave it to man as a symbol of freedom and enlightenment. He is a great watcher. Okay. And notice the notice the prophecy doesn't say I am Inki. It doesn't say that. So. It could be referring to someone related to him, maybe his children, or perhaps a brother or a sister. Okay? It says, the sons and daughters of Enki will be lifted up. Now, Enki is most commonly referred to as the father of man. So, he's talking about the whole of the human race when he says the sons and daughters of Enki will be lifted up. Okay? Homo sapiens. Lift it up, lift it up by the knowledge of their true nature. I look at that as people finally realizing that they have divine birthright to be here and to live in harmony with their fellow man, building the lives that they were truly meant to have. Okay, next line. As encoded in the essence of life, all right? Hmm. That the essence of life. When I hear that statement, two things come to mind. First of all, it's encoded. So that means that it's hidden and someone has to extract it either literally or metaphorically. So the essence of something is the smallest, most basic part of something. You know, if you take it away, the rest of it will cease to exist. It is the source, core, it is a seed of a fruit, things of that nature. It is the nucleus of a star, 
It is an atom of an object. It is the soul of a person. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about essence. But the essence of life in this context may all could also be referring to our actual DNA. So perhaps we will come to a new understanding of what we previously rendered as junk DNA. All right. In so many words, all of this shouts a great revolution, a great revelation of what it means to be human in our divine heritage. The impossible will become possible. And so the prophecy to me, it sounds like the beginning of a utopia. We will see, you know, we will have to see. We will have to see on that. Okay. That's the end of that. And so now the individual who channeled this being and recorded this message at the end. Well, he originally stated that this matria is one of the Anunnaki. And then he eventually stated that the Anunnaki are what the Gnostics refer to as archons and that the archons are demons which unfortunately invokes all kinds of, you know, terrible thoughts and imagery because we still live in a pro-Christian good versus evil type of society, right? And, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe this is all demonic. But what cannot go without being said is that the word demon is an English word which came from an older Greek word, diamond. Daemon or diamond. And that word, this is why I love etymology because it tells you a deeper truth on the words that we use. Diamond did not have a negative connotation. I repeat, diamond, which is where the word demon came from originally, it did not have a negative connotation. It referred to 